and we can invite it for the um, you started the recording test test sounds good this is so cool i agree welcome to our tv studio here at social justice week round of applause laugh track cue oh great we have an engaged audience today so I am Caitlin Henry, I teach here and I see many criminal justice students here. Thank you, Professor Burton for bringing your class. And this is, um, Antonio actually asked me, another former student uh, and fabulous person here to know. So definitely talk about uh, work opportunities once you graduate um, in the field with Antonio. So uh, we have been doing this conference since 2015. It was started by Shelby Wade, who was a student in the sociology department. Um, and led by faculty there, and I've taken over. And we have a fabulous student leader in the back I'd like to recognize, Kenya, if you want to wave, who's also a criminal justice major. And um, we are going to have programs all week. We also have tickets to some events. Um, they are outside on the table, the discussion, uh, so you want to talk about race, and we have a reception before with food and drink. Um, so grab tickets, and if they're gone, find me. And then 32 Sounds is on Saturday. It's an interactive sound and performance from someone from the band La Tigre, if you know them. But that is our introduction to Social Justice Week. And we will typically um, do a land back recognition and introduce our speakers. And then in between, we will have various videos from past years and bios. So if you stay after the session, you can get a preview of what is to come. But since we have our speakers up on the stage, they are going to introduce themselves and I will let them take it away now that we've tested our recording for the future. We don't have Zoom option, um, but we are recording them so students can cut them into cool videos in the future. Thank you. All right. Welcome our speakers again for our TV show. Yay. So yeah, I want to start off by saying thank you, Professor Henry. Um, one of my favorite classes as a student here was being a student uh, with her. And I would like to, you know, say it's a great honor for, yeah, it's a great honor. What are you doing, Don? That's all right. I just didn't want to block those folks. Okay. Awesome. So it's a great honor uh, for me to present at this year's uh, Social Justice Week um, as a student at Sonoma State, I should say as an alumnus at Sonoma State. Uh, this institution um, did a lot in shaping my worldview, and it's a real joy for me to be able to return, um, share a little bit of the work that I've been doing since graduating, as well as sharing with you all why disrupting the school to prison pipeline is so important to me. And uh, three of the main takeaways I hope everybody leaves here with today is a little better understanding of what is the school to prison pipeline. I imagine many of you are familiar with it. Some of you are probably pretty educated in it. Um, secondly, like what are some of the organizations in this in the Bay Area doing to um, minimize the number of students that are being kicked out of the classroom? And uh, lastly, how some of you can get involved in this work if this is something that that you're passionate about. Um, and just to do a little brief intro into how I got connected into this work. Um, so, you know, going back to freshman year, um, I was expelled from a comprehensive high school. I was uh, booked into the Marin County Juvenile Hall and kicked out to County Community School. In Marin, that's the school of last resort. Um, and because I was on probation, um, it was mandatory for me to attend an after school program. Many of you here might be thinking like, geez, you know, that's a bummer. Like when the bell rings, you just want to go home, play video games, uh, leave school, hang out with your friends. And for many, you know, that's a reality, you know, because I was coming from a dysfunctional household and a lot of the youth that I was, um, a lot of my peers during that time were also in that same situation as well. We were just kind of doing anything possible to really avoid going home. And uh, it was during that period where I met Don, who's seated here next to me, um, because he was the one that ran the after school program. And he would load us up into the YMCA van and take us out to eat really yummy food. 
um, to take us on these amazing field trips that our families just couldn't provide because many of us were coming from low-income households. And although there was a lot of tribalism present during that period between a lot of the students, like we just made this silent agreement that, hey, what we have here is pretty good. Like, let's not do anything to disrupt it. And we were able to maintain that uh, until the economy crashed and programs went upside down. Um, but that's a, another story for another day. Um, and just fast forwarding a little bit, you know, it was pretty evident that uh, whatever system was present during that era was ineffective at addressing a lot of the trauma that as you've had um, in that in that moment. Many of my friends ended up in jails, prisons, institutions, and uh, I'm pretty convinced that that's because that um, environment conditioned a lot of us for what it what life in prison is like. Um, and when an opportunity opened up to work here with Don, um, I jumped on it. I always stay connected with a lot of uh, nonprofits. Um, I'm a big believer that uh, by giving back, you heal yourself. Um, and that's, that's one thing that um, I get to do being a part of this amazing organization, Don. Don Carney, I am the founder and director of Youth Transforming Justice. And a uh, little bit about my background. Came to California in 75, from 75 to 85. I ran group homes for wards of the court and educational services because the public schools could not educate kids with uh, severe trauma histories. And um, I believe that um, our prisons are full because of trauma, by and large, and so we're eager to uh, heal trauma as early in life as possible uh, through our program. We'll talk a little more about that. Awesome. Thank you, Don. Um, so, and many of you familiar with the school to prison pipeline, but just to give you a definition here. The school to prison pipeline refers to policies and practices that push youth, especially minorities, out of schools and into the juvenile and criminal justice system. And I want to focus on one of the words that we see here, which is push. Uh, schools will focus on students who drop out. And while there's a small population of students who one day say, you know what, I have this life event that is maybe preventing me from returning to school, that could be, you know, the birth of a new child, or maybe some work um, commitments, most of the students that don't return to school are pushed out by policies and procedures like detention, suspensions, and expulsions that reinforce to a student that, hey, school is just not a place where you're succeeding. And maybe you might want to consider some alternatives. So let's always think of students that don't cross that finish line upon graduation as pushouts that pushes that places a lot of the and onus on the school as opposed to the individual when you're talking about dropouts. And who is being funneled into the pipeline? So we see a lot of groups here on the screen. And while all of them are affected, there is two groups there that are disproportionately showing up in a lot of the disciplinary data. And those would be minority racial groups along with students who have learning disabilities. Um, data from the US um, Department of Education shows that although 18% of students, 18% uh, of black students make up the total population, 46% uh, of them are showing up in the suspension data. And secondly, uh, students who are neurodivergent make up 9% of the total student population. However, uh, they make up 36% of the uh, population of youth who are held in a detention facility. And 
for many of the youth here, these harsher punishments are doing very little to address the misbehavior that's going on in class. And if we would, if a student was, who was suspended was to get real honest with us and tell us what they did during their suspension, they would probably say, hey, you know, I kind of slept in, I played video games, you know, I waited for my friends to get out of school um, to go hang out with them. And all of that makes sense, right? Because when you're asking yourself, like, wait, what did the school want the student to learn in suspending them? There isn't a real lesson that the student is um, picking up being home without very little to do. Um, so we want to ask ourselves, like, are schools utilizing the right tool for the right outcome? Okay, now I get to uh, share an old man's story with you. Uh, I am a divergent, uh, narrow divergent person, severely dyslexic. And uh, in the second grade, and this is the honest God's truth, I had a teacher whose name was Miss Ruler. And boy, did the name ever fit her persona. And Miss Ruler had a paddle about that long, about that wide, double fisted handle with leather strapping, somebody tricked this out. And then there were holes drilled into the paddle about the size of a half dollar. And because I was not successful at school, I was often admonished and told to come to the front of the room and assume the position. And I would get three whacks. No more than three, no less than three. And uh, several of my cohort also had that experience as well. So when I'm training young people, I ask them, um, if I'm to assume uh, goodwill on Miss Ruler's part, what was she trying to communicate by beating me with a stick in the second grade? Very sophisticated stick. And they generally come to the human conclusion that, you know, nothing good can happen to that. I say, well, if I am to assume goodwill on her part, she thought that tool might somehow help me succeed. And I want you to know 19 states today still have laws on the books where corporal punishment is legal. They all happen to be in red states in the South and the West. So it's really important to use the right tool for the right outcome. All her tool did was make a little man embarrassed, resentful, and rebellious. So in restorative practices, we look for tools to use that are going to provide the outcome we're looking for. And generally, our jurisprudence system in this country doesn't have that logic framework. In fact, we abandoned rehabilitation several years ago for punishment. Next slide. Oh, this one's mine too. All right. So it's pretty obvious by the data who's being targeted. And young people of color are carrying a intergenerational trauma and trauma leads to mischief. Mischief leads to being on authority's radar and you are pushed out of school. In fact, uh, I was on a juvenile justice commission uh, when he was in high school, and we had a seventh grader. Marin County is a small county, so we mix uh, middle school kids and high school kids in that school of last resort, and it was the height of zero tolerance. And this little guy brought a Swiss Army knife to school to show his buddy because his grandpa gave it to him, and he was proud of it. Boom, he was expelled, put in the county, and within about 
10 days, he's carrying drugs for the older kids. So we went around and we looked for an alternative and we found a thing called youth courts. We'll talk a little more about that later. Thank you, Don. So what factors, uh, what are the factors that contribute to uh, the school to prison pipeline? So zero tolerance is a is a idea where you can punish all students using a similar model that pushes students out of the classroom. And this became popularized in the 1990s as a response to school shootings and a fear that crime was really starting to take off. Um, and as a result, we saw a real spike in the number of suspensions and expulsions at school. Um, it did very little to address the behavior that was going on in class, but it did um, exacerbate the number of students of color that were less likely to graduate. And we also saw the criminalization of misconduct that many of you would maybe agree is normal school behavior. Fights and drug experimentations happened at school, sometimes at a very young age. And when students are penalized for that, um, it feeds into what we later uh, will address in the next slide is mass incarceration. And Professor Garland, uh, who teaches law and sociology at NYU, describes it as a rate of imprisonment that is markedly above historical and comparative norms for societies of this type. Uh, one of the phenomenons that happens here in the United States is there's large groups of people um, that are incarcerated. Those are usually young men of color who live in large urban cities. And here we have the international rates of incarceration. I wanna warn all of you not to look at this data as a perfect, um, perfect explanation for the punitiveness of a country because many of them uh, measure their data different. However, what this graph is really good at telling you is the number of um, people that are incarcerated based on the overall population. And for some of you, it might come as a surprise to see that the United States is leading this metric um, as a wealthy and democratic nation, you would think that we have a system in place that's able to prevent crime more strategically as opposed to just eating the uh, jails and institutions. Um, and Don, could you discuss what the spike yeah. in the population is? So the spike uh, began with uh, Nixon's war on drugs, moved into Reagan's war on drugs. And then Clinton's three strikes. The Democrats' hands are not clean either. And another concept, uh, they dumped rehabilitation for punishment. And that was a very conscious, cruel decision. It's very short-sighted economically. <laughs> and then the other thing that happened in the 70s was deindustrialization. Uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I graduated from high school and on a Saturday and Monday, I worked, I walked into the mill and went to work like three generations before me. And in that heavy industry, there was a mix of uh, people of different races, different ethnicities. And it, when Pittsburgh got deindustrialized, it killed the middle class in that town. And uh, 
all kinds of chaos created uh, because of that, which led to incarceration of a lot of uh, men of color. And what we know about the U.S. incarceration rate is that it's incredibly high and incredibly um, unequal. Here we can see the rate at which white and black men, um, the high risk that white and black men face of going into the prison system by not graduating school. And you can see the great disparity that exists between white and black men with no high school diploma. We've come to know that the single biggest indicator of someone ending up in prison is them not graduating high school. And knowing this information, you would think that as a nation, we would be dedicating a large portion of our resources to making sure that every student is able to cross that finish line and not have to face some of the ugly realities that could come later on. And, you know, I want to, I want to add that there is a lot of other factors that really contribute to some of the, the data that we see here, um, especially for those who are living in poverty. That could be homelessness, um, addiction to, to drugs. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just not having that high school degree that just matters so much when um, looking at this data. And there's three challenges that um, individuals who are currently incarcerated, as well as those who'd be soon to soon to be released, will have to have to overcome. One of those being invisible inequality. Our nation does a real good job at erecting prisons um, in areas which are really isolated from the rest of society. So we don't really see or think about those who are behind bars unless you have family members who are incarcerated. And if you do, you have to travel to great lengths just to be able to visit them. I live and work in Marin. We have um, a prison there, San, Qu San Quentin. Many of you are familiar with it. And it seems like it's more of a historical landmark than an actual prison based on how you can get a pass, go in there, learn about the architecture. Um, and a few times are they actually discussing the people who lost their life in there or continue to be incarcerated in there. Um, and those are all things to consider, not to take anything away from St. Quentin, I think, has amazing programs. I'm really excited to see its uh, shift from a American prison to adopting the uh, Norwegian model. Some interesting for you to for you all to to look into. Um, and secondly, another challenge being cumulative uh, inequality. So, if a young person or if a person is incarcerated, they're released their likelihood of being able to earn a uh, income is reduced by 52%. Um, you can imagine the stress that must place on an individual who has a family and um, there are a lot of people counting on him or her um, to, to really deliver. Um, and for some, you know, that might, that pressure might force them to then consider returning to a life of crime and increasing the, the likelihood of them um, going back into prison. So intergenerational inequity. Uh, there's only one group more likely to end up going behind bars than foster kids or wards of the court. And those are children whose parents do time. Uh, they are the prime targets for ending up behind bars as well. And a lot of this is in relation to intergenerational 
uh, trauma and intergenerational poverty. So we really need to break that chain to keep young people from entering the prison system just because they've had, they've been dealt a, a tough hand in life and that tough hand has been handed down from generation to generation. And I want to say there's some really bright minds that are bringing their bringing the data to the streets. One of them being Professor Hoffman, who is a uh, professor at UCI, um, and she put forth the Crossroads study, which seeks to understand the long-term outcomes for youth who are tried uh, formally for their first offense, meaning that they see a judge or tried informally, where they're maybe connected to a diversion program. And there's a lot of, um, there is a immense amount of differences from county to county in terms of some of the different diversion programs that exist, some of the uh, metrics or some of the information that uh, judges, probation officers, and um, prosecutors use for determining if they're going to let somebody um, off that first offense. But bringing it all back to some of the data that we see here on this graph, uh, individuals who are tried their, during their first offense um, are 60 times more likely to reoffend within a period of five years. And individuals who are tried informally during that first offense are only 43 times more likely to reoffend. And when we look at the incarceration data, uh, we could also see that within those five years, um, those who are tried informally are a lot less likely to end up um, back in, in handcuffs. And it's data like this that um, keeps, that helps to reduce the number of um, youth who, or reduce the crime rate, as well as inform some of the uh, decisions that we make um, as an organization when it comes to addressing some of the needs of the students. Um, in, in our community. So uh, YTJ, Youth Transforming Justice, um, we started off as the YMCA Marin County Youth Court. Um, I sort of twisted the Y's arm to do this and the Y will do anything that if you raise the money, it makes them look good in public, you can do it. And that's part of my skill set. So uh, we were taught by the public defender and the uh, DA to replicate a superior court criminal process. And our very first case, I had a very well-meaning seventh grader in a three-piece suit <laughs> uh, prosecuting. And he prosecuted the hell out of the kid on the stand. And this kid was already traumatized and he got re-traumatized. So I immediately told the kids that we were working with, we've got a win-lose system here. We have to find a win-win system if we're going to help kids. We're not going to replicate what happens in the regular system that tracks them in further and further into the system. So we did some nosing around and we found restorative practices first, began adopting those, found trauma-informed care, began weaving that with the restorative framework. And then we really came onto something about dumping the adversarial process altogether. The adversarial process gets in the way structurally of somebody taking accountability for doing something dumb. Because if you say, yeah, I'm accountable, okay, you just admitted guilt. 
boom, you get X amount of years. So we found that once we got rid of the adversarial role, we have a young person play the an advocate that advocates both for the community's well-being and that individual student's well-being. And we found this to be highly supportive and uh, efficacious in helping young people change their direction and not repeat behaviors uh, that get them into that school to prison pipeline. So we have two programs. We started off by keeping kids out of juvenile justice. We had a strong relationship with our probation department. And uh, then we moved, we, we took a public health model. We looked at this as a public health issue. So what's feeding that? We looked upstream. Suspensions were a clear link in that school to prison pipeline continuum. Uh, nothing happens good while kids on their own, unsupervised for three to five days. So um, we started diverting suspensions. And we're currently convinced the Centerfell School District to permit us to do what's called community building circles in elementary school to identify young people who have high adverse childhood experiences, high ACEs, high trauma, and start providing them with resiliency supports before they start failing in school and start self-labeling themselves as failures. So we already went over this one about the adversarial format gets in the way of accountability. Uh, we co-create with the respondent, we co-create their restorative plan with them. This is what creates an authentic uh, sense of accountability and accepting that restorative plan rather than a begrudging one. So we try and tailor it to that individual's strengths and interests as well as repairing the harm and repairing the relationships that that harm has impacted. Those are equally important portions of the framework. So here is the process to be uh, eligible for the diversion. You have to say, my bad, I made a mistake. I'm willing to repair whatever harm that mistake created. More importantly, whatever relationships that were impacted by that harm. But we want to go beyond the violation. We want to get to know who this individual is. Every young person is so much more than the stupidest thing they've gotten caught for by some authority figure. And our ethics are, you know, be curious, be supportive, don't be judgmental. Don't project your biases, your opportunities in life on someone who may not have those. We co-create the restorative plan and it's based on, it's a strength-based system. And here is some data um, that we've collected over the years and we're incredibly proud of. So over the last 18 years, uh, youth Transforming Justice has been able to keep 1,400 youth out of the juvenile justice system. Um, out of those uh, 1,495% of them have completed the program with only a 5% recidivism rate after one year of completion. We noticed that those who um, don't complete the program usually are moved out of the county. Um, and, you know, that's a interesting data set to go into another time. Um, and we have diverted thousands days of suspension. So the youth have the option to say, you know what, I'll rather take the suspension or I'll take the accountability for whatever it was that I did that got me in trouble when they're in the principal's office um, and they're able to remain on campus while they work through their restorative plan. And we've connected youth to 27,000 hours of community engagement. We don't call it community service because this isn't us um, having youth go out and pick up 
trash. Although in the moment they might say, geez, like I shouldn't have done whatever thing I did that got me in trouble because this is not really fun. Um, rather, what we want to do is connect young people to projects that they're passionate about, interested in, um, and something that's um, going to maybe get them further away from that thing that got them in trouble to begin with. A lot of youth, um, especially during this era, they um, start smoking high concentrate THC. They get hooked on it pretty early. And maybe before um, they got hooked, they had a passion for music, for sports, for all these different things. And we ask them like, hey, during the program, during um, the period of time that you're with us, try to take a little break. We'll connect you back to those things that you loved. And maybe by the end of it, you know, you won't have to go uh, back to that uh, vice that you were you were hooked on previously. So uh, David Davidson Middle School, it's the largest middle school in the county and the most impacted. And uh, this is a good case study. We uh, we lowered the suspension rate from about three eighty to about forty eight in three years. And there were several components to this. One component, which was dramatic, is uh, there's a small white population in this school that got queued up first for A through G um, opportunities to prepare for college. Just shifting that and making that available to the kids of color on an equal basis to the white kids dropped the suspension rate. A lot of those kids felt like they, they couldn't compete because they couldn't get in these classes and gave up early. Once that shift hurt, happened, some of those kids began to focus and get on board. Uh, the, uh, the framework of punishing a kid to teach them a lesson makes no sense whatsoever. All it does is have the young person internalize the label of loser, failure, what have you. Now, one thing that's important to know, we've been in and out of Davidson. We're still there now, but we've been in and out since this period three times. Uh, the administration at one point said, hey, Don, we got this. We don't need your support anymore. And the uh, the white uh, vice principal running it um, lost fidelity with the program. And he was actually having white kids predominantly trying brown kids with their grades in their lap. So I, I attended one of the hearings at the AP, the assistant principal's uh, request because he thought he was doing a crack up job. Uh, that day we held three cases, uh, two for marijuana and one for Xanax. And the white kids went from, well, you know, that Xanax is not good for you. And how come your math scores have dropped? And I was just appalled. I wrote a blazing letter to the superintendent and said, some kid's going to die of laced, uh, Xanax with fentanyl on your watch, you got to straighten this out. So they brought us back in, straightened out the program. So these programs have to be monitored so they're delivered with fidelity or you're not going to get the uh, outcome you're looking for. Next slide. Okay, let me frame this up a little bit. Uh, on our 10th anniversary, which was in 2014, next year will be 20 years old. Uh, one of the kids had this harebrained scheme about invite the chief justice. And I said, boy, that's a reach. Write her a letter. We ended up with the chief justice. And luckily, we were making a documentary. You can look at it on YouTube. It's called YMCA Youth Court Finding Justice. And we ended up having her speech in the middle of the documentary. And it was probably one of the latest moments in my life when she, we sent her our data. I had no idea she'd actually read it, 
Let's watch it. It's going to start with a trailer Mr. for the bailiff will swear in the respondent. Dennis, would you please walk over to the witness stand? And when you get there, remain standing and raise your right hand. To have someone forgive me would be like giving me another chance and respecting that I messed up. And also them realizing that it was my mistake and that I could learn from it. A sense of one's belonging and a sense of one's uh, importance or significance in a family, in a work setting, or a community is huge. I'm unwilling to share who I am with you based on the experiences I've had. I was a little brother. He was a big brother. He was like the main influence for me because my dad wasn't there. I remember he got suspended once in like middle school and that's kind of when it started. One suspension in middle school for a kid of color is the highest predictor of them not completing school. The suspension in high school is a very high predictor of them being involved with the juvenile justice system. So after I got in trouble, my mom was telling me how I was going to end up like my brother. In school, I got punished for what I did. I got three days of in-school suspension. So that basically means I get to spend my time sitting in an office doing nothing. I thought I was going to be dealing with probation. So I was kind of scared because I didn't want to have a record. Youth court's a court run by kids for kids, but it's highly effective because it's positive peer pressure. Our peer court is based on restorative principles. So kids find it uh, supportive rather than punitive. Teenagers are like the most vulnerable people in like. It's just so hard to see how people kind of mistreat them. Youth court kind of show that we do have some allies. It is a pleasure to be here to celebrate YMCA Marin Youth Court on its 10th anniversary. And so, of course, when there are troubles or issues in school, the right approach is a restorative approach. The right approach is a collaborative approach. It's about looking at this young, developing mind and understanding that it hasn't fully developed, but sometimes it's facing very adult, grown up challenges. So, I join you here today in commemorating this splendid program. We could take this program and your commitment and your leadership and replicate it across the 58 counties. And so this youth court, I think, holds such incredible promise. And you've already fulfilled that promise with your 900 students who've been diverted, your lack of recidivism, your 95%, uh, I think, success rate in the program. Those numbers are unheard of. They are unprecedented numbers in criminal justice. I also have to say the two programs that you have here that I have learned most about, and that is your decisions under the influence having to do with alcohol and drugs and safety training, as well as your peer for it as an alternative to suspensions, really struck close to my heart. Knowing that in truth, a shorthand way of referring to your program as this is criminal realignment. This is where it starts. This is the solution to California's problems of public safety and prison overcrowding and criminal justice. It is the seed of a program like this. At this time, the bailiff will. Okay, so uh, the pandemic uh, had a big silver lining for our program. All the youth courts in the state shut down. We were down for two weeks and we popped back up on April 1st. And the reason we were able to pop up is most youth courts are connected to probation departments, police departments, uh, judiciaries. And all those people were very anxious about confidentiality. And I knew we could handle the confidentiality. And because it was the YMCA, they didn't pay much attention. They let me do what I wanted to do as long as it made them look good. So we went up online and we were the only youth court up and running for about six months. And because we were on Zoom, kids from all over the state said, hey, our program shut down. 
would like to participate with you. So we had them observe a couple of times and then they could participate. And the one thing that stood out for most of them is Moran ain't got no prosecutor. And that looks pretty good to me. So they went back home and they agitated and said, let's dump the prosecution. It gets in the way. So we've been able to impact other youth courts throughout the state. Another good thing that happened is I had highly trained alumni who went off to college and now they could hook up with us. So prior to COVID, our age range was 12 to 18. Now our age range is 12 to 25. And that coordinates with what I call the risk-taking years. 12, you uh, differentiate from the family system. You start wanting to please your peers more than your parents. That's a normal evolutionary process to frontal lobe development. So within that time frame is when young people are taking their largest risks and the families and the culture have to support them surviving those risk-taking years. And it's not their choosing to take wild risks, it's their biology that drives that. Uh, young people at that age have an inordinate amount of uh, natural dopamine that's easily triggered through novelty and risk. And that's a survival mechanism, if you think about it. Our brain's the same brain that crawled out of that cave many years ago, and had to go kill a woolly mammoth and drag it back to the cave so everybody could chew on it for the winter and live. So our brain and our risk taking is left from that biological era. It's no different. Only now we have fast cars and crazy drugs that can kill you as easily as a woolly mammoth. And shifting from courts to support. So prior to the pandemic, we used to hold hearings at the um, Marin City courtroom. And for some, walking into that space is incredibly intimidating. I know personally, you know, I was always anxious going through the metal detectors. Um, and I can only imagine um, how it must have felt from some of our youth from minority communities, because um, they have a different relationship with with law enforcement than um, than a lot of other people. Um, the virtual proceedings as well were less intimidating for our youth where they felt like they weren't in this big room and they felt like there wasn't all of these different faces and um, and visitors who were there observing them. Uh, this transition also helped to not re-traumatize re youth and perpetuate intergenerational trauma since a lot of the time we had parents who were bringing the youth to the courthouse and for some of those parents, they saw some of their loved ones um, go in that room or go in one of those rooms and never come back if they're fighting um, immigration cases. Um, and this move really helped us to uh, drive, to address a significant driver of systemic racism and the school to prison pipeline. Now, what's one of the real cool opportunities that opened up during the pandemic was um, our organization receiving funding to support a internship program for both high school students as well as college students of color, where a lot of the youth that were um, being referred to our program are students of color. However, it's a lot of the students, it's a lot of the white youth that are participating as volunteers in this work. Just so happens they have a little bit more time on their hands because they're maybe not debating whether having to get a job to help their parents um, keep the lights on. And we wanted to make sure that uh, getting a job wasn't an obstacle that was preventing youth from being able to pursue their passions or their interests. Um, so we're now able to pay high school youth to participate in our proceedings and we're able to support and we're able to pay college students to help both um, 
case manage some of the youth who are going through the program to help uh, run some of our programs that we have in person at our offices in San Rafael, and also to expand restorative justice through the larger Bay Area. Don, maybe you can share a little bit of the work that we're going to be doing um, in Sonoma County. Yeah, we, uh, we've we been contacted by a school in Sonoma County that would like to shift from a punitive framework to a restorative framework. And one thing that they've identified is that since the COVID shutdown, uh, the kids not only lost, had learning loss, but they also had emotional uh, development loss. So therefore, um, behaviors are a lot sharper, a lot more physical. And we're going to go in with restorative practices and trauma-informed care and give them some support. Um, we do train other probation departments. Uh, we're training Mendocino County currently. Um, and uh, we offer trainings to high schools about how to shift to a restorative trauma-informed uh, system. We really believe students should be a partner in addressing school violations through the discipline of restorative and trauma-informed practices. It took me a long time to craft that statement to educate educators. And uh, we really approach young people as partners in this process, not just objects of receiving it. Um, a good example is when we shifted from the YMCA and had to form our own nonprofit. Yeah, the, COVID killed the Y financially. So we were providing more resources to the Y than the Y was supporting to us. That didn't make much sense. So at 73, I opened my third nonprofit of my life. I don't recommend it. But uh, we asked the kids at the leadership meeting, and the way we define leadership is if you show up on a Thursday and you open your mouth, you're leadership. So that's the first building blocks of leadership, being present and having an opinion. Ask them what should the new organization be called because we're a new nonprofit. Seven and a half minutes, they came up with Youth Transforming Justice. And I was just stunned. And I said, why that? And they said, isn't this what we're doing? And I said, absolutely. So I went out and trademarked it so nobody could steal it from us we live in that kind of country. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Don. Uh, so if there's any students that are interested in learning a little bit more about our internship program, I have our website information up on the screen. You're welcome to check us out. Um, if you go to the staff section, you'll see all of our emails. You can shoot me an email. I can uh, send a flyer to you. I'll be more than happy in uh, meeting offline uh, to explore this possibility a little bit more. Um, but again, like, you know, we we can't, um, there's not enough educators, professionals, therapists to really address all the trauma that students are dealing with um, in the classroom now. So it's so important for some of you to help them in a near peer model um to successfully complete um high school especially when we look at some of the data and know how scary it is for those youth that just don't get that high school degree yeah and if you'd like to observe our proceeding it is every wednesday at 4 30 it's on zoom shoot us an email and we'll put you in the queue to observe but you will be sworn in to you know say you're not going to divulge anything you hear so we we're real careful about confidentiality, but it's a great opportunity to see young people holding each other accountable in a compassionate, empathetic fashion that works. Beautiful. Yeah. I want to say that's it, unless there's any questions. I don't know if we got time for questions. One for our Zoom. It's on, so we're recording it for later. Uh, before I open it up for Q&A, everybody has an evaluation form on their chair. 
you can fill it out online or the old fashioned paper way and then turn it into me or just leave it on your chair when you head out. We rely on these to pick speakers uh, for next year and we turn them in to get funding so we can pay our speakers. So if you get your internship there, you end up working there and then you come back and speak, you know, this, this survey will help that. So who has some questions? Usually Professor Burton's a reliable plant and he'll just ask a question, but I know a lot of you <laughs> chat in you. classes I've been in with you. So who has some questions? I know lots of people have been struggling to get their internship placement. So what kind of questions do folks have? Very I got a question for you guys. Anybody here ever suspended while they were in school? Did you uh, reflect on your behavior during that suspension or did you do something else? We don't have to give you the mic for this. You don't have to be recording. <laughs> um, I didn't All right. We have someone right there. Appreciate okay. it. So what was the question again? I forgot. Sorry. Uh, uh, I asked, suspension, right? Yeah, I asked if anybody was suspended and did they think that that was an effective process for them to do better at school? Oh, well, I got suspended for fighting and I was suspended a couple times. Uh, and uh, I mean, it was a, it was a good punishment because I got to spend time with my parents and my parents pretty much taught me you know better than probably the school would have at the time you know they just were like oh we'll just send them home you know and leave the parents to deal with them but you know I know some people maybe not have that luxury of having parents to help them out you know so yeah anybody have any questions for us So I, I enjoyed your uh, presentation today. So why would why would students uh, want to do this internship? What would be a, a good learning experience for them, and, and what can they expect from it? Yeah. Introduce yourself for the recording. If you oh, the yes. Year. I am the interim internship director for next year, and I like this type of program because it's the idea of uh, holding folks accountable by asking them to be better, you know, than just punishing them. That's pretty easy. So I, I like this concept. So thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. So while we don't consider a student's major when they apply to intern with us. We do see that a lot of our applicants are studying criminology, psychology, and child development. And I can, of course, see some of the added value in someone who's maybe thinking of going into law enforcement, uh, working with uh, a population that is um, systems involved, and getting some um, hands-on experience on what it's like to help support a young person through what we call a restorative plan. So making sure that you're connecting them to community um, engagement opportunities. So they're satisfying their hours, making sure that you are helping them um, show up to peer solutions so that they can get some credit for supporting other young folks. Um, and as well, something that we didn't touch on um, too much, but that was mentioned is our drug and alcohol safety skills training. So if you grew up in the larger Bay Area, um, there's an incredible amount of wealth and with wealth comes a lot of access to drugs. A lot of the youth in Marin um, are struggling with um, a lot, are struggling to navigate um, the risk-taking years, and many of them have formed different vices. Um, and a lot of the work that we do, and we help bring in some of our um, college interns, is to run our survival skills training, if you will, where we teach students um, how to provide, how to know and when and how to provide support to a friend that's maybe had a little bit too much to drink. Like, how do you know if that person's gonna wake up with a headache? Or maybe this is something uh, more serious and you gotta pick up the phone and call 911. 
We work with them on how to use Narcan, how to take the keys away from a friend if they'd had too much to drink, um, how to not let your friend be a victim of sexual assault. Um, and aside from that, you know, we help to dispel some of the myths um, around drugs and alcohol. Um, and really what we're doing is just to help keep as many youth alive as possible. Um, one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest uh, tragic uh, factors that are causing youth to die um, is um, fentanyl. And it's something that we're working to build a lot of awareness around. But going back to that question, um, if you're interested in helping to support the work that we're doing at schools to shift the culture from punitive to restorative, if you're interested in getting some knowledge on restorative justice and restorative practices, um, if you are interested in working with a population that can incredibly benefit from your help, then please shoot it, shoot me an email, shoot me a, a call, um, and we'll get you connected. Um, and even if there's some work that you're doing that's restorative justice, that's based on restorative justice or in um, addressing some of the racial disparities that are just present in, in uh, our counties, like we can also get you compensated for that work as well. Because I mean, this is like a, a team effort. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, that, that's what I'll say. All right, before we close out, one more pitch. Henry, do you want to wave your hand? So folks on your way out, please go say hi to Henry Frank um, and check out his art. There's art he made in prison and upon release, and it has to do with many of the themes that we hear, heard about today. So check it out. And um, until you do, let's give a round of applause for our fabulous speakers. Thank you so much. And we'll be here all week. And grab your tickets on the way out if you want to come to the uh, shows at the Green Music Center.